Hey everyone, Weston Ackmore from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, and Happy New Year! Okay, that was a dud. It is the start of April 2023, which means Happy Corporate Japan 2023 Fiscal New Year as of the start of April. Uh, and I will get into why I'm wishing everyone a Happy New Year. It is very uh, relevant to this episode. But what's on the menu for today? First, let's just quickly go over the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia's decision earlier today when they left rates unchanged rather than hike. And then we will also just touch on the OPEC shock to crude oil upside. Then what I want to do is just kick off what's going to be a historic and extremely consequential month of April for global markets across asset classes. And that is because of the Bank of Japan, Governor Kuroda and his unprecedented decade-long tenure of just nonstop radical easing and policy experimentation taken to the extreme, that will undergo the most important leadership change in the modern era of modern central banking uh, as the keys of the world's duration anchor will be handed off to an incoming Governor Ueda this weekend. And then therefore the weight of the global bond markets and various other markets, but namely the rates markets, will get shifted onto the shoulders of a complete wildcard enigma. Um, and in this historic month of April, in which there are no other major central bank policy meetings other than what we just had today with the RBA and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand tomorrow, but April will be culminating at the end uh, with the April Bank of Japan policy meeting, where we will get the first true idea of what the stance of the world's final QE holdout is uh, in this next extreme change. All right, let's first talk about the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia. Earlier today, the RBA had their policy meeting and they held the cash rate unchanged at 3.6%. And that would be the first pause of unchanged after 10 consecutive rate hikes in this current cycle for the RBA, um, in which the cash rate basically started off at 10 basis points off of zero, the zero bound and then surged to 3.5 current. So RBA Governor Lowe in a statement said, the quote, the decision to hold rates steady this month provides the board with more time to assess the state of the economy and the outlook in an environment of considerable uncertainty. Ah, so the long and variable lags. Basically, here we have yet, yet another major central bank who has paused its rate hiking cycle for now. And the RBA pausing is certainly noteworthy for the rest of the developed economies who are undergoing their own respective rapid rate hiking cycles. Um, the RBA was one of the earliest out of the gate with lifting rates among the major developed central banks in this, you know, this era of inflation that we have. Um, and look, I know what the counter argument is, right? Uh, the, look, RBA Australia, it's its own unique and idiosyncratic situation. They have mortgage owners getting sh getting killed on these, you know, rate hikes. And just because RBA is among the earlier central banks to start their hiking cycle, it doesn't mean that it's any sort of a, you know, leading canary in the coal mine for other central banks. Therefore, it's stupid to extrapolate RBA policy and <laughs> apply it to the Fed or ECB or Bank of England or what have you. Okay, yeah, I get it. All right. Fine, all, all, all that's fair, okay? However, when the RBA pauses their rate hiking cycle after other early rate hiking peer central banks like the Bank of Canada have also paused their rate hiking last month as the Bank of Korea, okay? Those are the central banks that were the quickest out of the gate to lift off of zero. Um, and they're now all pausing. And by the way, the RBNZ, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, they're also kind of the fourth member of this, you know, early to move club. Um, and they have their policy tomorrow, so let's see what they do. But R RBA, the the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Korea, they, they hiked early, they hiked rapidly, and they have now all paused. And yes, all of these can be brushed off as idiosyncratic and have no bearing on the Fed and the ECB and the BOE, BOE and all that kind of thing. I don't disagree with that. But just to make the counterpoint, we all basically can uniformly say that this current era of inflation is by and large a global phenomenon, right? Yes? Right? That's not a trick question. Like, of course it is, right? It, it is a global phenomenon, meaning inflation didn't just appear suddenly and independently and coincidentally across every country. This is an interconnected global economy, and so of course there are spillovers. So, if we are going to just accept that this inflation is indeed global and interconnected, 
yes, to differing degrees, but not independent or some purely idiosyncratic and coincidental phenomenon that's happening country to country. If we are willing to just adopt that this concept kind of as is, then I think that we should also perhaps not just knee-jerk resort to just brushing off another one of these early rate hiking major central banks now hitting the pause button as just completely, totally irrelevant to all these other economies who started later in the rate hike cycles and currently have yet to hit their respective pause buttons. Okay, that's all I'll say. Uh, on to crude oil and the OPEC shock of this, you know, cutting 1.1 million barrels of production that came out of the clear blue sky into Asia market open yesterday, Monday, and basically sent Brent crude and WTI futures up 8 or 9% um, at market open at the time. Now, uh, clearly, I'm not somebody who you should look to for about, you know, the fundamentals of crude oil supply. Okay. Um, you, look, you want to name who's the uh, forefront expert and the kind of most straightforward and direct oil analyst out there? You go talk to my, my buddy Rory Johnston out there. Okay. He is uh, the best. Here's what I'll say, though, regarding the OPEC shock, specifically, uh, you know, as it relates to the Saudis. So you can really draw direct parallels between OPEC um, and their behaviors and the decisions and the decision making processes and their use of media and leaks and their overall kind of mentality and approach um, as the self perceived market pricing bodies of you know utmost influence. All of those sort of characteristics I just mentioned, you can make direct parallels to uh, OPEC and central banks, namely the Bank of Japan, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their all that stuff, right? Um, I think I even said this in a recent episode of Market Dev just the other day, right? But and I forgot, I f forgot who coined this phrasing, and so my apologies. But as I say, Japan is the OPEC of the foreign fixed income markets or the international fixed income markets, or the international sovereign bond markets, okay? And that really rang true with this production cut over the weekend and the OPEC rhetoric thereafter, right? That, you know, this is for market stability measures, right? And the hitting of short sellers of crude, um, and that this was OPEC reasserting itself as that which caused the shots on market pricing and not the speculators and wrestling control back. And any and all of that could be word for word coming out of the, either OPEC or the Bank of Japan regarding JGBs. And look, I'm not just making like this kind of tie in as like a lame transition to the main topic for today, right? I really do mean it when I say that DM rates markets is to BOJ what crude oil markets are to OPEC. Um, there are very direct parallels, okay? So, you know, kind of with all that said, kind of a takeaway that I have is, like, just generally speaking, when it comes to assessing these sort of markets, right, these markets that um, have some sort of top-down cartel or body of, of, you know, individuals, a small minority of very concentrated power of individuals, that preside over these otherwise, you know, free markets, these global uh, macro assets, right? I mean, you could do like as much supply and demand and fundamental analysis as you wish in order to come, with, come up with like a directional market view. And obviously that is very, very necessary. Um, but at the end of the day, if there is someone at the top down, you know, kind of level um, that actually has the printing press or the supply well at its fingertips, um, if you're in a market like that, you're always at risk of this outsized market influence. And so therefore, when it comes to certain markets that aren't purely free market forces and invisible hands at work that are setting prices, and instead there are markets in which a tiny, you know, these tiny minority of individual actors are the price impactors or if not price setters directly, then you need to study these folks and look at the world through their lens if you want to have a shot at trading these top-down metal macro asset markets directionally like you need to see what it is that they're being driven by and pushed by and influenced by and pressured by what are what other motives good bad doesn't matter right just be purely objective but just find out what it is like you know put yourself in their, their shoes like look through their eyes for example so last year like around this time of year okay so like around march 2022 so like one of my many kind of half kidding conspiracy theories that i'm constantly conjuring up in my head um was that so 
crude oil was surging in, in Q1, right, of, of 2022, right? So basically up through 100 and then to 110, then to 120, then 130, right, on WTI crude. And then sur- and surging alongside global inflation rates that were also breaking out and surging, by and large as a result of surging, you know, energy prices. So at that time, what I was saying was, um, so you can thank Masa Son, the CEO of SoftBank, the Vision Fund, for the global inflation because he took 40 billion dollars of saudis and of mbs's money and went long tech companies at top tech valuations before, right before they got decimated and because of these horrendous losses on vision fund investors capital saudis pushed crude oil uh, prices uh, higher and thereby contributing to cpi upside so therefore you can thank masa son for inflation now i was kidding at the time though maybe not too crazy a thought but either way what i will say is today if you fast forward to today i'm sure that there are people out there and this wasn't me but i'm sure that there are have to have been some people out there who actually did go long crude as credit suisse became nearly worthless or worthless right because saudis are major equity investors in credit suisse and you know maybe not the primary reason for this OPEC sudden kind of cut, but their Credit Suisse investment getting wiped out and this subsequent production cut um, and this targeted short squeeze, I'd like to think that CS imploding may have to do a, a bit with that. Like, I don't think that was totally in, uh, irrelevant, um, you know, non-factor. Now, again, I, I didn't think to make this tie-in um, to go long crude on, you know, CS dying. But if anyone did, good for you, you may be purely lucky, or you may be dead on right for the right reasons. But the point is, right, these, like, the certain macro assets and markets, such as crude oil, such as developed market government bond markets, um, such as gold, such as currencies like the Turkish Lira, and just a, you know, myriad of others, yeah, these might be global macro assets and markets, but they're also subject to hyper-concentrated influence down to an individual level in some cases. And when that's the case, be cognizant of that individual or group of individuals um, and their situations um, on a broad level and look at the world from their shoes. The decisions made are always going to be self-interested, um, but may not always be directly related uh, to whatever it is that, you know, whatever market or as a class it is that they have control over. Um, it could be something else tangential that's happening to them that is causing them to behave and act upon the markets that they, they have these kind of heavy-handed controls over, right? Like Credit Suisse and Saudis or what individuals of the Bank of Japan and their decisions are subject to, like, this is why, among many other things, this is why I've been studying, if not, if not straight up stalking Governor Crowd over the past decade and his, and what his behavior is and the, the board's behavior collectively and individually. The press leaking um, of policy tests, the, like the lone dissenting of voting, um, the fact that they absolutely do not care about CPI as it relates to Bank of Japan yield curve control policy changes in the current moment and so on, right? And so therefore, this new guy Ueda, who's coming into the Bank of Japan, nobody knows what the hell he stands for or what he'll do or attempt to do, or desire to do, let alone his execution and sales capabilities to pull it off, whatever that policy is, or whatever the no change of policy is. I will get into my broad BOJ view at the end of this episode, but for now, what I'm just saying is that anyone who's making calls on what a governor, Bank of Japan Governor Ueda will do at the first press, uh, or at the first BOJ meeting in April, at the end of April of this month, the very, very consequential Bank of Japan meeting under new leadership, under this wild card guy. Anybody who's making a call based on who the guy is, is just talking nonsense, okay? I've heard this um, kind of feedback from a few people uh, at this point, and so I take it upon myself the, you know, the, the blame and responsibility for this, but it seems that um, I might not be very clear uh, who who this is addressing this podcast okay this is not for asia investors asia based investors or investors of asia assets okay this is for 
anybody and everybody who has capital at risk that is exposed to global mar macro forces. So basically anything and everybody, right, in, in any kind of investor or trader. This is not for, you know, investing in Asia. So if you're not invested in Asia, it doesn't mean that this is irrelevant to you. It's actually quite the opposite. If you are an investor of assets and markets in Asia, you probably don't really necessarily need this podcast and this information that I've been doing because you already are following along. What I'm doing is I'm pulling out things that are happening out of this region that have direct impact or any sort of some sort of implication onto your markets in the United States equity markets or the European markets or whatever it may be. That's who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to those who are in, or who are looking to invest in Asia. I'm talking to anybody who is an investor, period. These are things that you need to know out of this one third of the planet that is not at all covered. Like when I talk about, you know, the JGB market, for example, or even dollar yen or, or like the yen, for example, right? I'm not like saying this to a, a broad audience because I believe that the, you guys are JGB investors. The reason that I'm, I talk about those is because those two assets in particular, the JGB market and dollar yen have direct and significant cross asset impact on the risk-free United States treasury yield, which therefore has impact on global risk assets. That is why I talk about the JGB market and dollar yen. It's not because I think that you have that you're like long JGBs um, or short JGBs for that matter. Uh, it's because that they're like anything that I say, just assume that the reason that I am bringing it up is because there is a broad global asset market sort of uh, tie in. Um, that is being missed by the broader sort of consensus media or the narratives that are going on, okay? But I'm not talking about it for, like, as a niche asset investment or something like that. Why would I do that, right? Have that kind of default assumption in your head. Like, if it sounds idiosyncratic and very kind of niche, I'm not talking about that particular asset itself. I'm talking about that asset because there are implications to far bigger, broader global assets. And it's usually what I'm talking about are things like implications on the US treasury market or the US dollar or something like that, okay? So let's kick off this fiscal year, new year by discussing Japan's portfolio allocation behavior, okay? Which is not only critical to know, but it's also very different from what other major Western developed regions and their respective portfolio outlooks and broad sentiment is um, as it currently stands, okay? In a sort of normal, you know, fiscal year, if you will, um, typically you have Japan corporates with their overseas businesses and overseas earnings, and yes, their overseas investments. Um, they repatriate their capital back to Japan, essentially, in order to kind of, you know, polish up their, their balance sheets and do some window dressing and so that they can make very nice fiscal year and earnings presentations for their investors and all that. And that takes place, you know, usually like mid-March or so. And there are like hedge funds that kind of front run that seasonal trade and they go long the yen and all that. And then capital is like capital and assets and all that are then redeployed back out of Japan as the largest foreign capital allocator. Okay. So basically, so it's repatriation, you know, into fiscal year end in March, and then starting in April, it's kind of a redeployment back out. That's how it usually goes. It's obviously not cookie cutter, but typically that's how, you know, things things go. You have to keep in mind, there's also like all different kinds of investors. There's no such thing as a Japanese like monolith investor of foreign bonds by any means, okay? Uh, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, corporates, all, all these sort of subcategories, okay? And then within those subcategories, there are differences once again, right? Insurance company A and insurance company B might have completely different portfolio management strategies. Um, they might have completely different hedge ratios and all that. And then even further, well, let me just say that just because at the beginning of a fiscal year, like right, right around now, just because you have some CIO of uh, some life insurance company or whatever, 
publicly traded you know, company who goes out and says, for this next fiscal year, we plan to allocate XYZ and have a head, FX head ratio of this and so on and so forth. Just because they say that doesn't mean that they're actually going to follow through with it. They have to just say something, but doesn't they're going to be at the whim of whatever markets are doing. If like it's a, just kind of calm markets, fine. They might That might be their plan, but that plan could be scrapped immediately. Um, and they can and the Japanese can become very active in terms of portfolio management on a day-to-day -day basis or an intraday basis. And we saw this throughout all of 2022. So if you look at fiscal year, Japan fiscal year 2022, okay, which basically started in this time last year, April 2022, until last Friday and the end of March. Over that time period, but let's just call it calendar year 2022. We saw the largest divestment out of foreign bonds by Japan, Japanese capital on record, namely out of U.S. treasuries, which then resulted in the worst bond market total return performance on record. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. Okay, Japan had the largest net selling on record in terms of bond holdings, foreign bond holdings in 2022. So you're going to start to see a lot of headlines and articles like the following. Okay, this actually just came out from Bloomberg um, a few days ago. A $3 trillion threat to global financial markets looms in Japan. Japan's super easy monetary policy sent a flood of domestic money overseas. Investors are bracing for what comes next. Okay, um, basically the gist of this sort of article, right? And there, there are various kind of iterations that you'll see for, of this, but the very broad gist of it is... There's a major overhanging risk in markets currently because there is um, this massive, the massive size of foreign capital that's deployed out of out from Japan, that may repatriate back into Japan, if and when yield curve control is removed by the new Bank of Japan governor, or if the Bank of Japan tapers and allows for higher nominal JGB yields domestically, and then trillions in repatriation that necessitates for massive selling of foreign assets, of bonds, of stocks, and what have you. Um, that's this ma major risk that's overhanging markets, right? What happens if Japan liquidates all of their foreign asset holdings because there's yield now finally at home? So, personal view. So, first of all, as I just mentioned, this whole notion of, like, this risk of markets getting crushed if Japan divests their foreign asset holdings, as I just said, that, that already happened just last year or happening if you want to you know go that route and say it's not done yet fine well, i don't really care but either way what my point is japan sold the most foreign bonds and u.s treasuries on record in fiscal year 2022 in calendar year 2022 and 2022 was a year that saw a surge in foreign yields accordingly now look japan still holds uh more in overseas assets than it has currently sold okay in other words therefore they can they have the ability to sell more um they can sell more uh, but this whole like you know risk of japan's capital flight like back home this risk looming this looming risk of of japan's repatriation that's not something that's a potentially coming thing like what the hell do you think the 2022 bloodbath was that that was it it occurred did you, did you not did you miss that right and where where was the heads up in early 2022 before it happened why is this now a risk right so this is very odd and very much nonsense to me like to warn of something as a risk that already took place as a potential risk going forward because and it's stupid because it implies that the 2022 global bond sell-off therefore somehow isn't being connected to the record bond selling that japan did during that period it's very odd to not make that very obvious and straightforward observation right this isn't very complex dot connecting now was 2022's like worst bond market performance ever was that all and only due to japan outflows obviously not that's not what i'm saying but was the largest selling on record by the world's largest foreign bond investor, perhaps a contributor to the worst bond market performance on record? Yeah, probably. Okay, so that's one point. Secondly, this notion that 
you know, this risk that Japan will divest its overseas asset holdings, namely in fixed income and like sovereign bonds, because the Bank of Japan will start to raise the cap on yield curve control and thereby make JGB yields finally yield something. And that will attract all this Japanese capital back home to grab that juicy homegrown domestic yield, JGB yield, without the hassle of like FX risk and what have you. I generally think that this is also nonsense, um, and I kindly disagree. Okay, so currently under Bank of Japan's yield curve control, 10-year JGBs are capped at 50 basis points. In other words, the most indebted country in the world, as measured by government debt levels relative to GDP, 250% of debt GDP, the most indebted country gets to borrow for 10 years out at 50 basis points. Why? Well, the reason why is because the Bank of Japan has been the most aggressive buyer of JGBs over this last decade under Governor Kuroda such that it now owns more than half of the one quadrillion yen of JGBs outstanding, and it's setting a ceiling on the yields for which it hasn't yet acquired. Meanwhile, the risk-free 10-year U.S. Treasury yield has been 3%, 3.5%, 4%. That's the rate at which the risk-free United States government has to pay to borrow for that same amount of time duration, 10 years out. So, if BOJ, so if the Bank of Japan were to do this normalization an exit um, of this top-down price controlling of JGB yields, how high would a 10-year JGB yield skyrocket to? Let's just make up, like, I'm just going to make up some random numbers here, okay? But let's just say that JGB yield, yield levels went to 2%, okay? And the reason I'm saying 2% is because that's still only half of that of the 10 years treasury yield, more or less, or whatever it is. Um, but yields going from, like, less than 50 basis points where they've artificially been capped at uh, for much of, you know, this period of yield curve control, for it to go from 50 basis points, JGB yields, to 200 basis points is a fourfold increase in bond yields. What do you think that does to the mark-to-market value of unrealized losses on, for JGB holders who bought at what they thought and what they were told was an explicit floor on JGB prices at 50 basis points or at 25 basis points for JGB um, upper band limits were until December? Well, we just saw a very real, I guess, example of this via Silicon Valley Bank um, and what happens when bond investors go long at low yields and then yields spike, prices and portfolios get decimated. So let's say BOJ begins this accommodation removal, removal process, this tapering, okay? Now they can do it one of two ways. They can either just rip the Band-Aid off or they can do it kind of gradually. So let's say they they do the ripping the Band-Aid off and they vanish yield cur- curve control in one fell swoop, right? So that will instantly implode Japanese banks, pension funds, insurance companies, asset managers, investors' portfolios. Okay, it'll it, like evaporate. It'll, it'll be a UK gilts and UK pension funds in September of 2022 style, right? And what did that episode result in? Well, that resulted in the Bank of England rushing in to conduct emergency yield curve control so as to not have the UK pension system blow up. So, it would be quite ridiculous for the Bank of Japan to rip the ceiling off of yield curve control, only to then rush into the rescue with yield curve control. Or, the other thing they could do is, rather than do it all at once and have a self-induced you know, induced UK guilt blow-up and Bank of England-style blow-up, rather than do that on themselves, by doing it all at once, they can exit yield curve control in kind of incremental steps, lifting the upper limit band ever higher in, in just kind of incremental steps, right? Um, much like rate hikes, I guess, at the front end. And under this scenario, um, it wouldn't be a UK gilts and LDI's sort of blow up scenario, but rather this would be more like a Silicon Valley Bank scenario to the JGB investors who own JGBs at far lower yields, yields that were, again, supposed to be and entrusted to be capped or bond prices that were supposed to be cement floored. And let's say BOJ does, I don't know, 25 base points at a time, 50 base point, uh, basis points at a time of like yield curve control, you know, upper band lifting or whatever, right? To whatever the terminal rate of where markets naturally let JGB to, to settle in at, right? Wherever that may be. Let's say they did, that's how they, you know, that's what's underway. If that's the process, tell me, what domestic Japanese investor would find JGBs to be so appealing 
that they the further shed their already underweight U.S. Treasury portfolios to repatriate back into JGBs. Like, what part of the Bank of Japan pulling the rug out from under what used to be years of this explicit floor of central bank put on JGBs now just getting yanked out from underneath? What part of that would be makes JGBs attractive? Japanese investors or JGBs need to, you know, at least have a perception that prices um, have stopped falling before they plow headfirst into JGBs. Um, and they wouldn't do so at the first glance of drooling over 25 basis points more on nominal yields in JGBs, like the, the moment it's announced that day or something, right? Now, look, many of you are likely aware um, that it's been my personal warning, let alone my view, that since January or February of 2022, since last year, it's been my view that should the Bank of Japan lift yield curve control cap levels um, or remove, or get rid of it altogether um, under the right market setup, that can very much wreak havoc and volatility on global rates markets and thus global markets writ large. This is what I've been saying for well over a year. Take a look through my Twitter posts and, YouTube, and search for me on YouTube and you'll see my presenting of Bank of Japan yield curve control risk starting back in the beginning of like 2022, okay? Um, but... Yeah, so, so yeah, I guess I would say I'm in agreement w with these sort of voices coming out currently on BOJ policy risk overhanging global markets. Um, but really, to be blunt, and I'm just, you know, with all due respect, I would say, rather say that those voices are now finally coming around to agree with me rather than me agreeing with them. Yes, of course, BOJ poses a major policy risk to global markets and can explode... Uh, in cross as a volatility, even accidentally, as in by miscommunication by this new rookie governor, right? Or just market dysfunctioning, um, just getting to extreme levels, or whatever it may be, right? Yes, of course, I believe that. That's been my core reputation or warning of this, just by and large speaking. But global bond and stock markets imploding due to Japanese capital suddenly shedding off their foreign asset holding so that they can plow into the JGB market immediately, like after JGB raises the yield curve control cap and allows for a bit more in domestic nominal yield that's not how the mayhem unfolds okay that's not how this is the story is going to play out so all these sorts of calls um you know and and this commentary and these articles that have been surfacing a year too late about japan investor repatriation risk i mean by and large i wouldn't say that they're sensationalizing purposely or something like that, because I think that they're probably being genuine when they're writing these. So therefore, I just think that they're quite stupid, to be, to be frank, right? And they're just missing the, the big picture point. Also, Japan being the world's largest like foreign investor, Japan will never sell absolutely every last foreign asset that it owns, for JGBs or otherwise, right? Look, I could tell you from my years in finances in Tokyo and my kind of very different roles and different kind of angles and with my time here, I can say that by and large, right, the sentiment from Japanese investors, be they long only um, portfolio managers of fixed income as well as equities, or like just individual retail investors, whoever it may be, really, kind of almost blanket across the board, right, from my personal experience and encounters, um, there's a pretty consistent sentiment and outlook by these various types of Japanese investors when it comes to allocating capital. That would be basically that the grass is always greener outside of Japan. All right? That's something I've noticed very consistently. Obviously, I'm not saying this is always in everybody, but it's pretty close to being almost like, you know, uniformly and unconditionally so. I talked about this with Jack Farley on Forward Guidance last December after the BOJ shock meeting. But, like, every conversation about, like, markets here, right, uh, market risk, market risk or market upside, right, either way. So let's say they're talking about Ukraine and Russia or something from China or Bank of Japan or Fed or inflation or whatever. Good or bad, the conclusion always goes back to, well, I guess it got to be long SPX and or guess it better be long U.S. Treasuries. Like, that's what, like, conversations just kind of conclude with regardless of what the conversation is. I've noticed this. Like this is very consistent, right? Um, so there might may not always be a bid for U.S. assets constantly, okay? But there will always be long holdings of U.S. and foreign assets, right, by Japan, because it's perceived to be a, you know relative relative diversified safety versus you know relative to being just long the Nikkei index and JGBs alone, right? just pure Japan long portfolio, 
Um, and so therefore, after a year of record selling off of foreign assets and dumping of U.S. treasuries at record pace and record amounts, um, and now with what seems to be a potential foreseeable floor in Fed rate policy, I think that if anything, it's my view that Japan is in redeploy and rebuild foreign asset portfolio mode currently and not in continued repatriation mode let alone about to begin repatriation mode. And if BOJ starts to pull the floor further out from the JGB market, i.e. getting rid of yield curve control, that's just going to further entice capital allocators to steer clear of the JGB market until that process is done. Um, and they'll likely wait in foreign fixed income until that process is done. Uh, just as they had done by steering clear of foreign bonds like U.S. Treasuries when the U.S. was in the process of normalizing and hiking rates. They fled the hell out of U.S. Treasuries until there was a floor or some sort of kind of normalized process being nearing its end, right? They'll do the same thing with JGBs. Um, and if the timing of these sort of policy cycles are such that we're at a whole new kind of investment plan, uh, at the start of the year, right? Clean slate. You're underweight foreign bonds, most on record as a Japanese investor. And then the BOJ starts their JGB yield hike, hiking cycle just as the U.S. and others are wrapping up with their respective yield hiking cycles. Then I think that leads to the exact opposite of Japan capital repatriation risk. Exactly unlike or the exact opposite of what these sort of articles of a $3 trillion threat to global financial markets looms in Japan. Uh, it, my view is the exact opposite. But it is my view that net-net Japan is currently leaning more towards active reallocation of capital overseas, rebuilding foreign asset holdings, um, uh, and doing so more than like a net repatriation at this point going forward from now, and regardless of what BOJ will or won't do under this Ueda regime, especially like this first April meeting. Um, in fact, this kind of portfolio like redeployment of um, building for foreign asset portfolios this has already been underway this year so far in 2023 simply just due to how underweight foreign assets um, the Japanese portfolios became in 2022 I pointed this out a few times before on market depth um, but that third week of March of this year so just like a few weeks ago or two weeks ago or whatever right the weekly flow data from the Ministry of Finance show that Japan investors weekly net bond flows so the largest amount of buying by Japanese on record other than uh, the only other exception is March 2020 okay um, now that was also the same exact week last month that saw the insane swings in volatility in global yields um, and also the same exact week in which foreigners bought the most JGBs on record which is due to short covering and thus wiping out the so-called attractive domestic JGB nominal yields that had existed so when that happened, JGB yields were yielding less than the previous yield curve control 25 basis point cap, and yield starved and underweight Japanese capital bought foreign bonds. And so the latest data from this the week after now shows Japanese investors were once again massive net buyers. So they're buyers of another 1.1 trillion yen of foreign bonds last week. So basically in the last two weeks, we saw four and a half trillion yen of combined net buying over this two week period of foreign bonds by Japanese investors for the most buying on record for any two week period by Japanese investors of foreign bonds. Again, this was into fiscal year end, but again, this was a very kind of messed up and abnormal and idiosyncratic fiscal year portfolio allocation cycle. So look, maybe there was a, uh, you know, kind of rush to buy into fiscal year end last week just to have some proper sort of at least optically have like did proper diversified allocations likely these kind of levels of record size weekly buying amounts is likely not like a recurring thing but i think that over the course of this month um and just generally into you know boj at the end of april and then possibly beyond um and again regardless of what boj does or doesn't do we might just see this continued uh, trend of just net buying of foreign bonds by Japanese investors as they just rebuild their portfolios that are very underweight foreign uh, assets, you know, over the next few weeks. 
yes, you're probably going to get, like, you, you might get a week or two where they're net sellers, you know, of, of foreign bonds. Fine. But, like, the broader trend is one of rebuilding and net buying of foreign bonds by Japanese cattle. And when I say regardless of BOJ, by the way, regardless of BOJ policy, I also mean regardless of, like, the Fed as well. Or any, regardless of almost any of the existing known risks currently, okay? So obviously if, like, a meteor hits, that's not what, all bets are off. But all of the things that we know about, war in Ukraine, whatever it is, um, of the known risks, regardless of any of those Silicon Valley Bank and, and what, whatever, right? The, the like Japanese investors are, are, are in rebuild of foreign fixed income portfolio mode. That's my view. Okay, now I want to give kind of two recent examples of what I mean. Um, and note that, yes, these are indeed, these are idiosyncratic, but the purpose is just to illustrate how different the outlook and the activity is um, for the very same markets and conditions that we all get globally, but from Japan's perspective currently, okay? It's very different from that of a U.S. portfolio manager or a European-based portfolio manager, okay? So, U.S. and Europe currently have their own kind of respecting res respective banking crises, yes, right? It's safe to say that it's generally not the best time for banks at the moment, right? Or certainly March was not, right? Okay, quick example, um, two examples. Number one, Japan ticker 7163 okay that is SBI Sumishin Bank this is an online bank stock that IPO'd last Wednesday March 29th which is the first bank stock IPO in the world in you know 2023 but yes this is a bank stock that went through with its IPO pro like the the very same month in which there was the second biggest bank fail in the United States and the ongoing crisis of confidence in the non-behemoth banks and in the behemoth banks, in the major finance institutions, because in that very same month, Credit Suisse also disappeared into the ether earlier that month, right? And so that was the month, that, at the end of that month is when SBI Sumichin Bank held their IPO. And how that IPO listing go? Just fine. IPO price was set at 1,200 yen, Shares opened a little bit higher, like 1222. Uh, but basically, the IPO was perfectly priced, right? And then, how's it done since then over the last like three days or whatever? Stock is up, what, 8%? A few days of it being a listed company in existence. Nothing crazy, right? But definitely not some doom. And again, this is a bank stock that IPO'd at the end of March of 2023. A disastrous month for banks everywhere, or maybe not everywhere. Now, mind you that this was a, a company that originally planned to IPO one year prior in March 2022. A year ago was the one they originally were supposed to IPO, but they held off you know, on going public and doing their IPO because of Ukraine, the Ukraine-Russia war that broke out. So that conflict, that had them pause on attempting to raise capital and become like a publicly listed company and all that. But nothing in this past month of April, you know, March 2023 made them not go ahead with this listing like it seems like that was a good you know good read on market but can you imagine a bank attempting to ipo in the u.s last month even if it resulted in success like you wouldn't even know it wouldn't even be allowed to get that far to find out because underwriters and whoever else would have strongly advised to hold off you know saying like now's not the best time to ipo any tiny bank stock or whatever right but that's just what they did in Japan, and all is fine. Okay, so that's just one kind of anecdotal example number one of how different of market outlook and market activity and by various different parties in agreement um, and sentiment is for uh, amongst the Japan investors at the moment versus those in the other developed um, you know, markets and economies. So with this like kind of new fiscal year start, right, in, in April, um, not only is it, you know, fiscal, a new fiscal year for corporate Japan, but also it was actually like the, the first day under, um, the new president of Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group, which is the, is Japan's second largest mega bank. Okay. So this guy, Akihiro Fukutome-san, Fukutome-san is, um, CEO of Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corp, um, you know, as of this week. 
can you imagine being incoming CEO of one of the major global mega banks and financial institutions right now? Okay, and I'm not talking about UBS, right? Like that situation was obviously explicitly for the purpose of managing a post credit suisse acquisition and all that kind of stuff. But imagine if like Citi or Wells Fargo or Bank of America had an incoming CEO, um, and then you have this like bloodbath month in banking, you know, and that's how you start, right? One would think like, oh, how unenviable of a task or something like regarding, you know, bad timing or whatever, right? Um, maybe they'll have to do rounds of layoffs as first order of business or whatever it is. Um, so that's probably how, how that kind of thinking would go. What did Fukutomi-san of this new CEO of uh, Sumitomi Bank and Corp say or expressed um, or kind of lay out a vision for uh, on his first day as CEO? So there's a Bloomberg article about this in which they write, quote, Sumitomi Mitsui Financial Group, Inc., is on the hunt for bankers in the U.S. looking past the recent turmoil and concerns about an economic slowdown to accelerate its North American expansion plans. And then here's the other part. Japan's second largest bank is also studying requirements to become a U.S. primary dealer. Then the article goes on to say, over the last few months, major banks from Goldman Sachs to Bank of America have either been cutting jobs or pausing hiring as merging act as merger activity declines and market volatility keeps some clients sidelined. However, uh, Fukutome-san, the new CEO of Sumitomo Mitsubi Bank Corp, says, we want to invest more to expand in the U.S. Which is basically the exact opposite of what Goldman and Bank of America and the rest of them have been doing. Uh, quote, the U.S. is the biggest single market and it's still growing. Okay, so, SMFG is looking to expand their U.S. banking footprint for growth opportunities. It's very quite different from what U.S. banks or European banks are probably thinking, right, or looking at, right? Um, and furthermore, SMFG is also looking to register and become a primary dealer with the New York Fed. Okay, so they would be participating in treasury auctions and the like. Now, as of current, uh, to my knowledge, the only Japanese primary dealers right now with the Fed are Nomura, Daiwa, and Mizuho Bank. Here's what I'll say regarding Fukutomi-san's ambitions, or at least his curiosity to become a primary dealer of the U.S. Treasury market now of all times and like not at any point prior for the bank, right? Now, look, this may very well be a signal of strong interest and demand for U.S. Treasuries from Japanese investors of all kinds, and this is why they're doing this and responding to that, and the bank to become for the bank to become primary dealer. And it may very well not at all be a signal of any demand, regardless of whether or not such demand exists or doesn't exist. Who knows? One thing I can say pretty confidently, however, is that you don't start looking into becoming a primary dealer to participate in the U.S. Treasury auctions if foreign assets and U.S. treasuries are about to get sold off and capital to be repatriated back to Japan. That's not the time that a Japanese mega bank would start to explore um, how to become a primary dealer for U.S. treasuries and U.S. treasury options. Okay, so those are just two things from the banking sector out of Japan just in the last few days. days a small online bank IPO, and then this new head of the Japan Mega Bank upon a new fiscal year with new ambitions. And as I said, yeah, each of them are anecdotal, but these are nonetheless, these are examples of just how different the outlook um, or even the kind of fundamental approach and starting point is from the Japan capital perspective currently is versus that of its developed market peers in the U.S. and in Europe. And since Japan is the largest foreign capital allocator, it very much matters what Japan's outlook and sentiment actually is, if not what their actions being taken actually are. I'm not saying Japan is bullish foreign assets. I'm saying Japan is underweight them. And if BOJ keeps a lid on JGB yields, as it currently is, or conversely, if they begin a process of lifting yields under new leadership, neither of those two scenarios really scream for Japan to further sell off foreign assets 
for which they are currently underweight, and then repatriate immediately back home, you know, to plow into the JGB market. Just my view, okay? So, you're going to see a lot of those articles. That's fine if that's how they want to be, you know, kind of present them. But those are just kind of my two cents on the Japan private sector capital positioning and sentiment and kind of overview uh, at the moment as we kick off and head into fiscal year 2023 in Japan. Um, and as we enter what will become a historic month of April for Japan, for Japanese capital and for policy impact on global markets and impact that will... Uh, that may very well continue throughout the rest of the year and beyond, but, you know, really kicking off this month. Um, and so, of course, I will be right here with my boots on the ground to keep you posted with all things Bank of Japan, Japan, and Japan Capital Allocators, and so on and so forth, as well as, of course, other areas in Asia um, as it relates to global market impact and consequence. So make sure that you stay tuned into Market Depth this month of all months. Like, this is the month to do so. Keep your notifications turned on um, as new episodes come out. Follow me on Twitter at Across the Spread um, for market commentary. And I wish you all a very happy fiscal new year. Thanks a lot.